so my name is Jessica Cox and I am the Quilfer River Farm Bill biologist in the Fort Smith area. And today we are joined by uh, Mr. Craig Davis, who is the senior technician with Game and Fish uh, at Petty Jean WMA here in Arkansas. And today he's gonna be giving us an overview of uh, what they've been doing at the WMA. So their Oak Woodland Savannah Restoration project that they've had going on over there. Um, just a few housekeeping things before we begin. Like I said, this is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube page. Um, also, uh, Mr. Davis will be taking questions at the end of the webinar, but please feel free to type any questions you have throughout the presentation into the chat box, and we will take those in the order that they, were, that they come in at the end of the presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to Craig. Okay, well, good evening to everyone that's on here tonight. Uh, tonight we'll be talking about oak woodland, savanna restoration and management, primarily on Petty Jean River Wildlife Management Area. Um, so my name is uh, Craig Davis. I work for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission as a senior technician, uh, area manager, primarily stationed on Petty Jean River Wildlife Management Area. So this area, uh, some of you may know where it's at, I know some of you on here work there. Uh, this area is located about 30 minutes south of uh, Russellville, Arkansas, uh, right on the lower end of the River Valley, just right on the upper end of the Washita National Forest. So here's a picture um, from the very high, highest point of Petty Jean overlooking uh, the bottoms and then off in the distance, you got the uh, Washita National Forest. Uh, this, this is a picture of the uplands on Petty Jean, but Petty Jean is uh, a very diverse area that covers many different habitat types. So this, uh, this WMA was um, acquired around the end of the 1950s to 1960s. It's 15,542 acres. Uh, so some of these images I'm going to show you is so up here in this corner is where we'll be focusing at tonight. This is the High Knob area. Uh, closest town would be Mount George, a little bitty community. But the Petty Jean River cuts this in WMA almost in half from north to south. Uh, the majority of it is bottomland hardwood, but there are little sections of uplands scattered throughout it. So this we're kind of zoning in, zooming in to uh, where our site is that I just kind of want to show you uh, the ownership of this area. So everything inside this boundary is uh, Arkansas Game and Fish owned. To the south is the Washita National Forest, and but most of the land to the north, and the east, and the west is private owned property. So if we're zooming in a little more. Here's an aerial photo of the place, and you can kind of see. Um, this area in here is lighter areas, so the darker areas are more heavy canopy cover. Um, while this area in the middle right there, we have a private inholding of 40. That is a production pine stand, about a 12 year old pine stand. I want to just show you this because everything in the bottom is bottom land. So it just shows you the diversity in one specific area. Um, so when we talk about woodlands and we talk about savannas and we got prairies and forest and a lot of people um, may be very familiar with those terms while others are not. So I want to kind of explain what we're talking about. So in the bottom right hand picture probably looks like most forests you have seen in Arkansas. This is a closed canopy forest. It's got a high basal area, high canopy cover. It may be 100% canopy covered. Very little to no herbaceous growth grasses on the ground. Um, it might have a mid-story that shades the rest of it. Um, and then you've got this picture up to the top, which is an open land. Some of your fields may be fescue fields or Bermuda grass fields or field like this. There's just a mixture of all kinds of grasses and forbs and small trees and bushes. And so I wanted to show you, you got these two habitats, but on a woodland and a savanna, you have a mixture of both. So we've got our canopy trees, and then we have very little to no midstory and then a large herbaceous layer on the bottom. So you get the best of both worlds in one type of habitat. So most people that are talking about management, they're managing for these right here. They're wanting their quail and their rabbits, and they're wanting 
turkeys on the property, especially with turkey season. That's what a lot of people's mind is on right now. And these areas are great for those, but they also have many other species of non-game animals. A lot of your reptiles and amphibians, a lot of your different songbirds and butterflies love these areas. So oak woodlands and savannas, um, so why are they important? So why are they important? Oak woodlands and savannas, they provide high quality habitat for many game and non-game, like I've already said, but they're also almost ide ideal for wild turkeys. Um, these, these larger oak trees that have very open canopies, they're allowed to stretch out and grow. They provide great roost trees. They also have uh, that herbaceous underlayer for turkeys. They can nest very safely provide enough cover for them, but also give them enough of an open area that the hens can watch out for danger. And these prairie-like areas underneath have hundreds and hundreds of different varieties of plants. You might look in some typical forest, you might be able to find 10 or 15 different plant species underneath them. In these, there's over 300 species that can be identified in these stands. And I mean, squirrels, rabbits, all kinds of animals benefit from these surroundings. So historically, here's a map that I took off a paper that I will reference at the end because it is a great little article that University of Tennessee put out. But historically, these areas were, there's 32 million acres covered most of the Eastern side of the United States. Today, that is not the case. Uh, we're down to less than 99% have actually disappeared across the landscape. And there's a lot of reasons for this um, that talk about in this paper. Uh, lack of fires, Smokey the Bear did a great job of um, stopping fires going across the landscape. Conversion into agriculture, whether uh, civil culture or just farmland. Uh, land development, a lot of houses being built, a lot of land being cleared just for open areas, grazing cattle, uh, introduction, introduction of native uh, actually, introduction of non-native foraging grasses and exotics um, really played a part in eliminating a lot of these areas because you get Johnson grass and fescue and Bermuda and Lespedeza that comes in these areas, and they just will outcompete most of our native vegetation on the ground. And then you get uh, things like eastern red cedar or you get privet will dominate the mid-story and shade out these areas. So I want to take you to right now and tell you what we've done on Petty Jean. And this work started long before my time. Um, I've been out in this area since 2014. But in 2010, this area on High Knob Walk-In Turkey area, it, uh, it's a, originally it was 91 acres. A few acres have been added to it since then that kind of match this habitat. And this is an original... Um, one of the documents that we were looking at today that shows what the work was being done. So there was 512 acres of improved thinning across these uplands. There's about 1,800 acres in this entire upland on the west side of Petty Jean. And they chose this one little area right here, and it has a very specific site, the reason they chose it. And most of your savannas, it, it, they are site specific. The aspect, usually they were a south to southwest facing. Um, the soils are usually a thinner soil that dries out very quickly. All of these characteristics match areas that will burn, and fire is a key component of this habitat. Um, planning is also very important. Um, you can choose, I mean, you could possibly create savannas on a lot of different habitats, but some areas you will be fighting very hard because if it is a very high quality soil type and high quality area that's relatively flat that holds moisture, you're going to be fighting production of mid-story and, and even the canopy and trying to thicken in and grow faster than you can control. And historically, it may not even have been a savanna. So back in 2010, this area, um, the timber data that was done on it pre-cut of 2010 when it was completed was 123 basal area on average across the area. The prescription was to cut it down to 30 basal area, which is, is an extreme. There's two ways of doing it. Some people use a slower method 
or going from like 123, the way we do it today in a lot of areas is 120 down to maybe a 90 and let it sit for a while so you don't lose near the trees. Because if you cut from 120 down to a 30 in a year or so, you're probably gonna end up with a 10 basal area, which is that is just an index of how much trees you actually have on the area. And so this area, one of the issues was, is this area was in 2010, probably before that it was selected, all the work was done on it. And then there was a change of personnel, the WMA changed regions, uh, a lot of people moved on, some retired. And so from 2010, when this was cut to 2019, there was nothing done on this site. So for nine years, you cut an area back and then you left it alone, which creates a great seed tree site. We had massive production in this area. Um, in 2014, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission burn crew came up and investigated and looked at this site to burn it, and they turned this site down. Um, when back at the time when this was cut, they left large debris piles um, that I've been told were left for habitat or rabbits and just to have brush piles. Um, but the problem is, is over time, these piles were so big, they didn't fully break down. And then you had very narrow fire lines because you had very thick stands right up next to it that were not being maintained because there were many other projects going on and this area just kind of went to the side. Um, there was a change in field staff. Uh, myself, I started in 2014. Uh, just previous to me, less than a year, we had a new forester. And just within a year after me, we had a new uh, wildlife biologist that started on the site. So all of this started within a year. But you just got to think this area went from around a 30 basal area, forested cut area to very thick within about a year, within about actually nine years. So in 2016, we had an excavator working in, our, in this area, clearing out access roads, moving some of the bigger trees down, doing some fire line work. So we took this excavator up there and we cleared these debris piles out. And we, we feathered them out because we, a lot of them were very close to the line. So we feathered those out in 2016. And there was just a few of them, but we wanted to make sure and eliminate that risk. So I've got a lot of pictures, I'll go through them. Uh, this was a machine that was uh, brought to our attention, uh, our biologists out here. Uh, Jake, he found this machine. This is a uh, D3 dozer that has been converted to have a mulching head on the front of it. We bought this or rented this for a month. Um, and on here on the right, you can see this blue line is the fire line around the savanna. So we reopened this savanna fire line so we had plenty of suppression capability in this area because we, I'll show you here picture in a minute, but this was on the left is the savanna in 2018. Most of what you see right there is blackberries. Those blackberries were 1,500 this, in a stand. We went in there and there were 1,500 stems per acre on this stand. So if you clear an area down to very thin and walk away, this is what you get. So we cleared these fire lines. Um, we were also right next to private. So what's across the road, across this fire line is private property. And so we wanted to make sure we weren't burning 20 foot vegetation right next to private property. So here's just a few more pictures. Um, I've got some time lapse that will show the individual sites. So this is what this site looked like. Um, you can tell the mid story just took off. We had great regeneration of oak trees. I mean, if you're wanting to regenerate an area, cut it down to that and leave it alone and do nothing. and You'll get very good reproduction. You can kind of see we brought our dozer in here. We cleared these lines and right in here is where we mulch. So we took that mid story back probably 15 feet. So we had very good lines in this area. So in 2019, uh, we burned this area. And so this picture on the right is actually what the site looks like after a burn, which you can see most area that's browned up in there was the cedar that had taken over. We got actually a lot of good growth after the burn. This is about a month or so after the burn. And I mean, it looks pretty good. I would be happy with this on a piece of property just the way this looked um, because it did take a lot of the mid story out and it wasn't an intense fire and it wasn't really a cool slow. It was, it was just a great medium level fire. Um, so we burned this area first because we knew we were going to be uh, spraying this area 
And we wanted to see if we could control some of it with fire first and whatever survived and also get rid of that thatch layer so the chemical could really, really hit that mid-story. So we rented this piece of equipment. We actually, now excuse me, we contracted this piece of equipment. It's a skitter mounted sprayer. Uh, that boom on the back was about pushing 15 to 20 feet off the ground. So anything about 20 feet down, it would kill. And so we wanted to get that mid story out because we were trying to get that grassy, that herbaceous layer on the ground. And with a mid story that was as thick as those photos, you're not gonna get that. Um, this is what it looked like about a month later. Uh, the, most of the mid story, anything 20 feet down, it, it knocked back pretty quick. But all the chemicals we use uh, we did, were not residual to these areas. So we had grasses and forbs, I mean, sprout up pretty quickly in these areas. We had a very good response. So July of 2019, um, these are some pictures after that spraying. And so a lot of, a lot of control, um, but we were really curious to see. We wanted to leave this area alone and see what it would actually do on its own. And there again, it opened it up. You remember what it looked like before, how thick those stands were. Our poor forester, Steve, he went in there and did some plots when it was that 1,500 stems per acre. And a lot of the areas he couldn't even get into. You could not physically even walk through this. We ended up taking a dozer through the middle of it just to see what it looked like because you couldn't get a four-wheeler or anything through it. So it opened it up quite a bit. So in 2021, in March, we put our second fire through this area. So mid-story's gone. We had the herbaceous layer on the ground. Uh, we had our canopy. That was the way we wanted it. We were gonna put our second fire through this area and just see what we could get out of it. Um, at this time, we actually, we had the 94 acre savanna that was in the middle. And we also brought in the total unit was 312 acres. We actually had a partnership burn with this. Uh, if you notice this lower left-hand corner of the photo, that is private property. We had a burn agreement with them. We maintained the lines. We burned the whole area. Um, we had a great burn on their property and on ours. This area, the reason I show you the whole area and the reason we burned all of this together is we're going for habitat diversity in the area. So we've got fields, We've got thick forests that are 110, 120, 130 basal area and higher. And then we've got the savanna in the middle. That's a lot less. And some of it is right on the fine line between woodland and savanna. It just depends on what part of the area you're actually on. We've got creeks that flow along the side that have the riparian habitat with this pine plantation that's next to it. It's a very thick closed canopy pine stand for cover. And we have food plots all around it. And so this area here is all uplands and it immediately falls into bottomland hardwoods. You have rocky outcroppings that join up to bottomland hardwoods in this area is how fast this area changes from upland to bottomland. So these are our photos of that same area in June of 2021 post second burn. We have very little to no mid story where well, there are remnants of the blackberry uh, that hold in little pockets but majority of it looks just like this right here. And this right here, you can actually see some areas are thicker than others, but we have that very good ground component, a lot of cover. The, the, the time that we burned this, we've heard quail in this area. We have turkeys that actually were coming to this site after we burned it. We were leaving out after this burn and there were turkeys coming down the, our access roads in this general direction. And so this is one of my favorite photos. It shows how some areas are very open, um, you've still got plenty of canopy above it that are producing. Most of these trees are post oak. This is our post oak savanna. And so we have adequate acorn production. We have grasses and forbs all over the ground. Uh, as one of our old forces used to say, we've got groceries on the ground. And so we've got plenty of anything that these animals would need. Let's go through some of these. Um, so our step seven on this, uh, this photo right here on the right was taken this last week. So even in the middle of the winter, or coming towards spring, I mean, we don't have any leaves on these trees, but we still have adequate ground cover. There's plenty of open down there. Uh, we've got the grasses that remain. We're going to be monitoring this site. We've still got some areas that are kind of a holdout of really thick cedars that are growing. Some of those areas we'll cut and drop and leave. 
Uh, we're going to shift to a dormant season and growing season burns over the next couple of years to see how the uh, area responds different to different timing of fire. We'll keep maintaining these fire lines uh, and also these areas around it, we've even talked about pushing this savanna out farther or even feathering this habitat from this maybe 20, 30, 40 basal area area to some of these heavier stands and we'll feather them out for a couple hundred yards so we have more of a transition. So we went from 2018, I guess back if you wanna go farther to 2010 or 2000 when this was actually, 2010 when this was all cleared that went to this picture on the left in 2018 to what you see today in 2022, just this last week. So a lot of work was done on this site, but also this site was let go for nine years. I'm not sure what would have happened if we, the same people would have been on site to keep it going. They probably would have kept this maintenance going, but as everybody knows, other things come up and priorities change and people move around. So it, it just got left on the side. So two different, this is actually the same area. Those are the same tree on the left right there. This is the same spot, summer and winter, just to show you there's still habitat year round in these areas, as opposed to some areas you don't, if in the middle of the winter after acorns fall, there's not much there for food source or even cover. But this particular type of habitat provides a little bit of everything for most species. Um, so go along with that. Um, this is that document I was talking about. This is a University of Tennessee Extension Service. Um, article they put out, it's a little pamphlet. I advise everybody to look this up. This is a great little, I think it's four or five pages. It just shows kind of what these sites and site selection and site management. And um, if you're curious about this kind of habitat and how to create it, um, if you're on private land and this is something that interests you and you've got some of this habitat that's kind of a higher ground, south, southwest face, and you're curious about doing this, um, you can get on Arkansas Game and Fish's website that I've posted right here and ask for a private lands biologist or for Quail Forever. Um, they've got uh, biologists that can come out and evaluate your property and give you information to maybe see if this is see if this is So with that, uh, this is one of our photos of the area and I'll just uh, take any questions we got. Thank you, Craig. Uh, appreciate that. That was a great presentation. Um, we haven't had any questions come through in the chat box, okay. but um, as of yet, but if there's anybody that's on that has any questions, I would encourage you to go ahead and type those questions in and we'll be more than happy to answer those for you. Um, okay, we do have one. Um, from Mr. Booker that says, nice work. Have you surveyed the herbaceous richness? Uh, no, we have not. Um, I, I, am, I am no botanist. And so I would like to actually have somebody come out and see what we actually have in this area because until this, just this last year, this area, we, most of these plants were not even on the landscape in that area. And so to see what's actually shown up and I'd like to put a growing season burn into here as well and to see just kind of the full diversity of what's going to come up in here before we maybe get somebody out here to really take a look at what all is there. And one thing I do want to mention is in, in that other article it, it talks about this ground did not have many exotics on it. Um, this is this site. Some of our other sites, a lot of fescue and Johnson grass and Bermuda that were old pasture lands. This site being as rocky as it was and mountainous, it didn't have any of those. We have not, we've had very little even show up in this area. And so we weren't fighting that problem. But if some sites do have that, you better make sure and get that under cover before you actually do any of this work, especially opening that canopy up, because as soon as that stuff gets daylight, it will explode across the landscape. Okay, uh, we have one more question that's come through from Lauren Taylor. Um, they said, great results. I'm curious, it looks like most of the young trees got removed in the process. What are your concerns for tree regeneration as the mature trees reach the end of their lifespan? 
That's a good question. We, I was actually, we were talking about that today and trying to figure out as these sites go longer, I mean, over time, the fire will eventually, as these trees get older, they're going to die out. And then we're not really getting a lot of regen because of the fire, because the frequency of fire. There are different methods that I've read to change the help of this. You can do other rotational um, areas where maybe you divide this track into two or three separate tracks. And maybe for about three to 10 years that you just don't burn it. You get an area that allow it to actually regen and start to get the next generation of trees. Um, so we say we're right now just to the point of getting to these results. So that'll be a lot of the planning and monitoring in the future. Uh, all great questions and great answers. I'm not seeing any more questions come through on the chat. We may give people um, another minute or so to get those questions in. And then while we're waiting, uh, just to let you all know that in uh, on Tuesday, April 19th, we will be having our next webinar in this series. And that webinar is going to be focusing on uh, managing your woodlands for wildlife. So if you have woodlands um, or areas you would like to convert back into woodlands on your property, I encourage you to join us for that webinar um, to get some information on what you can do on your property to help improve those sites for wildlife. Um, okay, we have another one. Uh, that asks, what was the reference burger at all for the Savannah map? Uh, say that again. What was the reference burger at all for the Savannah map? Is this the one you're talking about, the article? All of that information was taken out of this extension service pamphlet here. Okay, I believe that's what he said. There was a map of Savannah's. Get yeah, this. It was out of this. Okay. Mm. Well, if we don't have any other questions, I'll go ahead and stop the recording and we will let all of you go. Again, thank you so much for joining us for this webinar. Um, it will be. Uh, posted to our Quell Forever in Arkansas YouTube page. So if you joined late or if you'd like to go back and watch it, it will be there for you to do so.